Hello, and welcome to the initial episode of a brand new Bruce Springsteen podcast, Set Lusting Bruce. Um, I have begged, pleaded, bribed uh, to my podcast leader, Rob, to let me do a Bruce Springsteen podcast, and he has kindly, finally said yes, and he has even agreed to lead this first podcast, so we kind of talk about what we're doing. Rob, welcome to Set Lusting. Okay, Jesse, first of all, you didn't have to work <laughs> that hard. <laughs> no, I didn't. You... Yeah, I, I think it was you recorded it for 80s Reboot, and then all of a sudden I got a note that said, I'm making this a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, so what I did is I joked about, and what you don't know is from the moment and um, to give you a little background, um, Rob had me as a guest on their con show, talking about cons, and um, and just just him and Martha are the sweetest people, just the really nice, and um, I was in Chicago for work, and we didn't get a chance to meet each other, but we've exchanged emails, and he reached out and said, hey, we're, we do one Doctor Who podcast that's very family-oriented, and it's him and his lovely bride and their daughter um cuckoo yeah, for who actually her show she created yeah. it and um and so he said i want to do another one and i think would you be interested in hosting it and i said yes so we've been doing that a little over a year and all this time i've been thinking about you know i really would just love doing a bruce podcast but i don't know that's that's a little bit out of our you know core shows though we do games we do books well and you know what jesse this is this is the thing and this is something a lot of people don't realize about our group about southgate media group Mm. you you see all that geek stuff you see all that tv stuff but do you know the whole idea was birthed out of other stuff and just being creative and finding your voice and feeding your passion so if your passion is bruce springsteen you know what we're down with that let's do it well, so I, it is in our wheelhouse. It's just yes. you can't tell yet. Yeah. Oh, well, that's good. So that's nice. So, yeah, to give you a little background, um, uh, Dave, who does the 80s uh, Reboot Overdrive, is kind of a little tired. And he said, you know, I feel like taking a break, but the show's rolling. We've got a lot of – we've had a lot of great Twitter uh, retweets and a lot of followers, and we're getting a lot of downloads. So I hate to lose the momentum. So he kind of threw it out there. Does anyone have any ideas on shows that I wouldn't have to do a lot of prep work that maybe someone else would step in and co-host or host so we could, you know, I could take a little break? And so I sent him actually a couple suggestions. I sent him Let's Talk 80s uh, books, Stephen King books, and that's because one of my best podcast friends does a Stephen King podcast. And I reached out to Lou, and Lou said, hey, I'd love to talk Stephen King books in the 80s. And that just recently dropped, I think. Yeah, um, that was either famous. yesterday or today. Yeah, and so we're also going to do an 80s movies uh, podcast. And then I said, would you be interested in me doing a Springsteen for the 80s? And he said, sure, I, I can't, inv- you know, I don't really have much to contribute. I said, oh, don't worry about it. So we got Tony from the UK and Colleen from there in Chicago that um, I had met Colleen on the road. And, you know, we kind of did an hour and a half to going through each of the albums of Bruce in the 80s. And my joke was, this is the pilot episode for my <laughs> Bruce uh, podcast. And uh, Rob said, no, I mean, this well, sounds fun. We, we took it as you said. You were joking, and we didn't yeah. think you were joking. We're like, oh, okay, so we've got a Bruce Springsteen podcast. <laughs> yes. And Jesse's doing it, and that's awesome. Yeah. So there so, you go. Yeah, so we're excited about it. So um, this is kind of our initial podcast. Uh, Rob's going to interview me, and we're going to talk about my Bruce background and kind of some of my obsessions on Bruce, and we'll go from there. So I turn the mic over to you. All right, Jesse. I am honored to be sitting in the driver's seat for this episode. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna just go through some of the questions you would normally ask okay. a guest, and uh, this will be the rare opportunity to hear you tell your stories. So, first of all, what is your Bruce background? So, um, wow, what a shocking question! No, uh, <laughs> I didn't see that coming. Yeah, um, you know, uh, I was a child of the '70s. I grew up uh, in a family that listened to, quote, 
the Blues Brothers, both kind of music, country and Western. Um, you know, a lot <laughs> okay. of Merle Haggard and, uh, you know, Porter Wagner and, and Mel Tillis and um, Johnny Cash, of course. And so um, my mom did love, like, Fats Domino and Bobby Darren and some of the early, you know, kind of 50s and 60s rock and roll. And so I you know, did not have a big musical background. And, you know, I listened to top 40 radio, like most kids in the seventies. And I heard a lot of Elton John and, you know, Queen and Barry Manilow and all these different things. And, um, went through a spell where I loved kiss, uh, believe it or not. Who and, didn't? Yes. And, you know, I loved when you, when you got a cold, the coolest thing was when you had that horse throat. So you could sound like Peter Chris on Beth. <laughs> All <laughs> right. Uh, Here you calling. And so, um, and then I discovered the beach boys after I graduated from high school in 1977, I f- discovered Brian Wilson and loved that music. So I, in around 1980, 81 I was dating the lady who is now my wife and um, a friend of hers had gone to school on the east coast and she talked about this guy named Bruce Springsteen and how amazing he was and a different girl I was dating we were at a Kenny Loggins concert and she they were playing darkness on the edge of town while they were setting up the stage which is kind of a mix Kenny Loggins you know Kenny Rogers and you know um uh, you know, Bruce Springsteen, but she fell in love with it. And wait, so, wait, wait, wait. I got to stop you there. Did you yeah. say Kenny Loggins or Kenny Rogers? Because you Kenny said both. Rogers. Yes, I, I, I misspoke. The, the, quick side line, she loved Kenny Loggins. Okay. And so I had this crush on Jill, asked her out, and did the same thing. I said, we're going to go see Kenny Rogers. She goes, Kenny Loggins? I love Kenny Loggins. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> okay, how can I convince her that Kenny Rogers is just as good as Kenny Loggins? No, so it was Kenny Rogers. And, um, you know, so I bought The River, and I kind of I liked it okay. And then, like everyone else in America, you know, born in the USA, I bought and liked all the hits. And um, kind of bought the live album. And, you know, I was just a casual Bruce fan. Okay. Then in 2001, after The Towers fell... They did that um, fundraiser right afterwards. Right, the the tribute show, yes. the one to raise funds, sure. And they opened with the E Street Band doing My City of Runs. Yes. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. And so I went and got The Rising, which was the CD, listened to it a little bit. And then um, even though I lived in Dallas since 86, whenever he had gone by touring – there was always some kind of family obligation, so I didn't get to see him. Okay. So in 2002, we got tickets to see him at the Rising Tour. And I went, and I will say this often, there are two kinds of people. There are people that see Bruce Springsteen perform live and go, wow, that was a pretty good little show. And then there's people that say, oh my goodness, I need to sell everything I own and get (laughs) on the road and follow this guy. And I was the second. (laughs) <laughs> Apparently. <laughs> yes. I fell in love with him. And and I and I was just I was so mad at myself because I didn't recognize every song they had done because I had not, you know, wore out the C D. So um when Devils and Dust came out, um I went to see him and I knew the songs and I played it and so I've um since then just become more and more obsessed with Bruce. I still love the Beach Boys, and but you know Bruce Springsteen has become my major obsession. In fact, my Twitter bio is not the guy who ran for president. You know, currently obsessed with Bruce Springsteen and Doctor Who. <laughs> I think that sums you up pretty well. Yes, it is. That is really good, man. Yes. yes. So uh, okay, so that's how you found him. Yes. Also, uh, so. What are the times that you've seen him perform? What's, what's, what are some of the highlights? I mean, you saw the one on TV. You just mentioned one concert. How many times have you seen him, and what are some highlights? So um, I saw him in 2002, and then when he came back, and The Devils and Dust was a pretty low-key album, and he was touring just by himself. Okay. Like smaller venues. And I I asked my wife, hey, can I go? And she said, Sure. Because she had no interest in going. And so, Rob, if you can picture, it's a two-level theater. 
Okay. And um, so I was on the first level at the very back, the far wall, as far as from the stage as you can get. Okay. To my right was the aisle. To my left was a pillar. <laughs> so I had a seat that was a solo seat. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> yes. At the very back. You were kind of king of the concert, but yes, at I the was. very back. And so a guy came up and said, do you want better seats? And I said, no, I'm fine. You know, you know how the way when you're walking into an arena, you know, the scalpers start, hey, hey, you need tickets, need tickets. And then he's walking off and I see he's talking to other people and all of a sudden it hits me. Wait a minute. I'm already in the venue. This isn't a scalper. Yeah, he's offering you a better seat. Yeah. So I walk over there and I go, hi, I'm sorry. Um, yes, I'd love a better seat. He says, OK, here. And so he hands me a seat. So I go and I start walking and they keep telling me, walk down, walk down. And I end up being like fourth row um, off stage right. Oh, my God. Fifth row. Yeah. So for the, this will mean nothing for non um, Dallas, uh, Dallas, Texas um, sports fans. But for the those who are from Dallas who understand, my seats were not as good as Moose Johnston. Who was the um, who is now a Fox commentator, commentator? But he was a part of the Dallas Cowboys '90 Super Bowl. He played f- a fullback, and his nickname was Moose. And so you couldn't tell if they were going Bruce or Moose when he came in. But they were better than Babe Laufenberg, who was the backup <laughs> quarterback for the Dallas Cowboys. <laughs> I was in that middle. Okay. And, and so they were absolutely amazing seats, and it was just him. And um, so that was pretty special because it was him, several guitars, and a keyboard. And he did a lot of talking between um, songs, talking about why he wrote this song and what it meant. And, cool. You know, and, and so that was really cool. Then I saw him once. During the Magic Tour in Dallas, then I saw him in Houston for the Working on a Dream Tour. And I told my wife, I said, um, I really want to see him more than once during a tour. And if, in, if you aren't a Bruce Springsteen fan, you may find that a little weird. But what, what happens is he does roughly um, just about a three-hour show every night when he performs. Okay. And about 50 to 60% of it are the same songs. The other 50% are different songs. So every show is different. Oh, okay. So, like, I, I'm a big um, James Taylor fan, a big fan of Brad Paisley, you know, but their shows are the same thing. You know, it they... They open with the same song. They have the video in the back that are playing things, you know, and that you see this show in Dallas, Texas, and then you see it in Shreveport, Louisiana. It's exactly the same show. Okay. Bruce doesn't do that. So Linda said, um, okay, um, would you give up Dragon Con to go see more than one Oh, concert? oh, okay. Uh, this this uh, this stuff's getting real, right? Yeah. Knowing you, that <laughs> is pretty serious. And I said, yes. Yes, I will. Wow. So we um, we drove, she and I drove together, and this is a great memory. Um, and I'm sure you and Martha will understand when I say this. My wife, Linda, and I had not gone on a vacation together without another couple or without the kid in years. We right. may have done a weekend, but I mean a whole week It'd been forever. We could not remember the last time. Wow. And so uh, 2012, uh, we got in the car and we drove up to Kentucky. And that's where my father had been buried in 2011. And we went and saw at the um, Veterans Cemetery in Radcliffe, Kentucky. We got to see my dad's um, tombstone and got to visit there. Nice. And we went to several bourbon distilleries. And that's where Linda fell in love with bourbon. And um, I had been training. I had been walking a lot so that I would be able to do the tours. And we had a great time. We drove up and saw some friends in Columbus. And then we drove up to Cleveland. We spent with a friend, uh, Tom Zoller, who does art for us and is a 
talented artist and writer. Oh, he's a great guy. We met him at Comic-Con a couple of yes. times. And um, just a wonderful guy. And um, stayed at his house. We saw Bruce in Cleveland, went to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame the next day, came back, um, drove back down to Lexington, saw a couple of more bourbon distilleries, went home. Had a, the best vacation. We called it our Bourbon and Bruce tour. <laughs> that was in April 2012. Okay. So then, um, Bruce goes off to Europe. And then he comes back for a fall tour. And and the reason we went all the way to uh, Cleveland is he, he wasn't going for any further west than New Orleans. And the New Orleans Jazz Festival, it sold out too fast for us to get those tickets. Okay. So then he came back and he was going to do um, he was going to do a Dallas show. Uh, no, he was going to do uh, he wasn't doing anything in Texas, but um, he was going to do Kansas City and and a couple others. And so I called Linda at work and I said, hey, Linda, Bruce is coming back and he's going to play Louisville. Buy him. <laughs> so, <laughs> so in November of 2012, we drove up. We did more bourbon distilleries. We went and saw him in Louisville. And uh, then I went and saw him in Kansas City like a week later. Okay. So that was pretty fun because I got to see him, you know, three times in one year. Sure. And then 2014, um, I guess, yeah, 2014, um, I saw him in Dallas. He did the NCAA double uh, A tournament that was a free show. Okay. Um, he opened, they, the band came out with Sweet Georgia Brown from the, you know, the Globetrotters thing. Yep, yep. And uh, they had a, they had a roadie dressed up as a uniform with a black striped you know referee uniform. Fun. They had a basketball, and him and Niels Laughlin did a jump ball, and they kicked the basketball out to the audience, and they went into a cover of Van Halen's "Jump." Oh, fun! And uh, that was an amazing show. And then I went to Nashville to see the show. And then I, we, my Linda and I both saw him in Houston. And so from April 6th to May 6th, I saw him three times in 30 wow. days. Wow. So that leads me up to 10 shows. Now, for those of you who knew, that is rookie territory. I mean, there are people, especially from the East Coast, that have seen him hundreds of times. Oh, my god! That gosh. have lost count of how often they've seen him. Wow. So, um... And so, yeah, so that's kind of a couple of quick stories. That's how many times I've seen him. And um, it really, it does become an obsession um, because I, I just think, you know, there's magic in his music and in his, you know, in, in the way it touches me. Well, I, I think that's what this whole podcast is going to be about. I, I think everybody that you're talking to is going to have stories like that. We have a cousin who mm -hmm. has done the same thing, which we will try to get him as a guest for you. <laughs> Uh, and when he first started going, he'd say, oh, you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm not a big fan, but I like him. And I went to a show and then all of a sudden it was, he was following him on tour and he was, he had some Canadian friends he kept meeting up with and he's like yeah, hanging out with the Canadians, seeing Bruce Springsteen, you know, multiple times a year. It's pretty fun. And, uh, I totally get where you're coming from. And I think your listeners will too. Yeah. And you know, it's uh, part of it is because each show is different. Um, they, they love performing uh, this latest version of the E Street Band. Uh, while we certainly miss uh, Danny, who Federici, who died of uh, Malanoa a few years ago, and then of course Karen's Clemens, the um, saxophone player that is probably as famous as Bruce. As Bruce, um, yeah, yeah. Um, so they've they've got a four horn section. They've got three back three or four background singers they had tom morella uh from rage against the machine was a guitarist with them this last tour and uh of course little steven from uh the sopranos and um you know playing and so there's like 12 or 15 people on stage that are just you know playing away and um I will tell the listeners, if you want to see, I think, something amazing, uh, a couple of suggestions. Um, if you do a Google search, um, Springsteen Jolie Blanc, that's J-O-L-E-B-L-O-N. It is a Cajun song that he wanted to record. He ended up not recording it, and he gave it to um, 
uh, Gary uh, Bonds, you know, he worked with back in the late 70s. Yeah. And so one of the things that's happened over the years is people bring sign requests to the show. And at one point in the show, Bruce will actually go out onto the pit and he will start picking up songs. Signs. <laughs> Fun. And then, you know, and they'll look and they go, oh, I hadn't played this one in a while. Oh, this is a great song, but I don't know this one. Oh, this is. And so someone requested Jolie Blanc. And he said, very obscure, very obscure. And they talk about it and they play the best version. Susie, who is their, um, you know, violinist, fiddler, she does a solo. And then one of the, the keyboardists has an accordion and they come out. And they had not rehearsed it. This is just them picking up and playing it. And it is amazing. Wow. Yeah. Good, good tip. Well, and also, I'm going to point one out, even though it's yep. your interview. No, we just watched the final episode with Jon Stewart and Bruce came yep. out. And it was amazing. What a band. Holy cow. Yeah. And, and you know, um, Land of Hope and Dreams, which is the song he did, is absolutely one of my favorite songs. And... Um, it, my son, um, had a little bit of rough patch when he was a freshman in college and, um, I was driving him back to school and a lot of ways he felt, you know, like, Oh, I'm, what am I going to do? And, you know, and I started playing this song and, you know, um, the, the lyrics talk about, you know, leave behind your sorrows, let this day be your last. Tomorrow there'll be sunshine and all this sorrow past. And, um, you know, it's a song of redemption and, and a song of hope. And um, and I thought it was a perfect song. And I think, you know, they cut to the final verse of Born to Run. Right. And, you know, how much joy was that? The, everyone in the, oh office, my gosh. All the staff out there dancing and singing. And I don't know if you stuck around, but... You know, John Stewart's thanking all the bands, and Max, the drummer, gave him the drumsticks. Yeah, we saw that. And I'm like, okay, that's a pretty cool souvenir. <laughs> you know, here's the drumsticks that they did uh, on my final show. Yeah. And I love the fact that he said, "Here is my moment of zen." Yes. You know? Yeah, it was it was wonderful. Yeah. Um, okay, so we've covered a couple of different things. I want to yes. know, sure. uh, favorite song. Or album, sure. And and you, I want you to cover what what you know that something that meant a great deal to you too. You just mentioned one. Are there yeah. other ones that you go? You know what? This album is the album. This song does this for me. There is, and um, I I certainly love um, a lot of the albums, and there are certainly songs. I think if you ask any Bruce Springsteen fan, um, Thunder Road is something absolutely beautiful and um funny story i had seen him seven times and never heard him do thunder road live oh wow you would think that would be a big one yes and so when the eighth time when it was at the dallas show he played it live and with um his wife patty doing backgrounds and it was amazing and then the other thing he did is he either did thunder road live as the final song or he did a song off high hopes which is a cover which is dream baby dream and i really was like oh i love dream baby dream that would be so cool to see it and all three shows he ended with thunder road so i was like okay you can't complain right so, <laughs> though i really would have loved to see dream baby dream um so i was i'll tell you a I won't, I won't take too long, but, you know, this podcast is going to be about stories. And so I was in the Philippines in Manila in January of 2015, and they asked me as a visiting director to do a management talk. Okay. And so, you know, what are your core principles? What do you believe? And I kind of talked a little bit about my management philosophy and um, and what I think you need to be to be successful. And, and my last point was, I'm going to quote Bruce Springsteen for you. And, um, and this is what I said. I said, well, my soul checked out missing as I sat listening 
to the hours and minutes ticking away. Yeah, just sitting around waiting for my life to begin while it all was just slipping away. I'm tired of waiting for tomorrow to come or that train to come roaring round the bend. I've got a new set of clothes, a pretty red rose, and a woman I can call my friend. That's nice. obviously a love song. Yeah. But I think that message is don't sit there and wait you know, enjoy what you're doing now. Too many times people go, well, once I get my business up, then I'll enjoy life. Right. You know, once I get that promotion, then I'll enjoy life. You know, you know, once my once my wife and I get through or my fiance get through these wedding plans, you know, then we can do things. And people don't enjoy the journey, Rob. Right. And I think that's the important thing. And and so that's been something, uh, you know, I'm currently looking for a new work home and I play Better Days. And that's the name of the song that I quoted all the time to say, you can't just wait for tomorrow to come or that train to come rolling around the bend. You know, you you have to embrace what's happening now. Right. It's and a good it, reminder to you. It is a good reminder. Um, and it. I just think that in a lot of ways, um, I see that a lot. I, we're a very busy society, and we're a very competitive society. And um, you know, I've, I, I, you know, I, I especially see a lot of the young people like rushing. You know, I'm not. Well, I can't wait for. You know, I, I once I'm out of baseball, I got to get into football or soccer or you know. I see a lot of young people in my when I'm managing a group that. Well, you know, if I could if I get off the phones, I'd be happy. Right. And you know, I say just enjoy what you're happening now. And so, um that comes across a little preachy, but I don't mean it in a bad way. I just want to remind people, hey guys, there is something out there and we should, you know, focus on this. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, very nice. And and like you said, it it's frameworked as a love song, but Yeah. There are so many messages in there. You can you can relate it to your life in different ways. So that that's a beautiful one, Jesse. Very nice. Yeah, and I think that's um, you know one of the latest songs he did is um, "We Take Care of Our Own," which is actually a sarcastic kind of like "Born in the USA" is not a anthem of you know patriotic love, um, but you know he talks about wherever this flag is flown, we take care of our own talking about the things that we haven't done to take care of our uh, citizens. And, um, but I do think that um, one of the things I embrace is, you know, taking care of our own, doing nice things for people that aren't your friends yet, you know, but just, um, so I had to go get some stuff printed today and I was at one of the UPS stores and I had some stuff printed and, um, a lady was um, carrying this huge box that looks like a return to Amazon. And so, you know, I opened the door for her and I said, are the rest of these going? She goes, yeah. And so I said, okay. So, you know, I went and grabbed, and they were really small boxes. If there had been a bunch of boxes, who knows, Rob? I don't know. Yeah, right. I, <laughs> you'd only go so far, right? <laughs> but, you know, I did. I picked them up and, you know, brought them in for her. And she goes, oh, thank you. And I said, oh, you know. I'm glad to help because that would save you a couple of trips. Sure. And, you know, I think about that, you know, and I think about, you know, we take care of our own. Wherever this flag is flown, we take care of our own. So that's another thing that I kind of remember. Very nice. Yeah. So uh, what about ways that Bruce has influenced you? I think you actually just kind of pulled <laughs> I some. Did. But but you I know what? Are, are there other things when, when you ask that question, are there specifics that you say, you know what, this is something that, that I take with me day to day, and it's because of Bruce or something Bruce has said or done? Yeah. So one of the things that I admire is, you know, he's been um, – it just was the 40th anniversary of Born to Run. And so he's been playing music. He's in his 60s now. And there's been, I guess, the most controversial thing is, um, you know, his first wife and him were separated. And so he had one failed marriage. But there has not been a lot of scandal about Bruce. Um, You know, you still get the thing, why is somebody who's a billionaire telling me, you know, that I should stay close to my roots? Yeah, right. Yeah, but I think that's just... 
you never. But he leave. wasn't. He didn't start exactly. there. Exactly. And and he so, doesn't act frivolous like he's won. Exactly. So I like that. I like the fact that he he seems to travel on his own pace, and he, you know, um, in the eighties he felt like he needed to move forward. So he, um, I've heard different stories, but um, the thought is he, you know, he fired the E Street Band and gave them all a million dollars of severance. Um, I don't know if that's true, but that's the rumor. You know, I've also heard other things that he gave actually parts of their um, money they earned resident, you know, um, the residuals for them. So I don't know, but everyone seems to not hate him and, um, you know, and kind of did his own music and kind of went his own way and then, you know, got back the band together. And he seems to... You know, I think the worst insult you can give to someone in the South is, you know, he forgot where he came from. Right. And, um, and you know, Bruce doesn't seem like he ever forgot where he came from. You know, he taught, I mean, you know, I know he's Darlene Love from the Phil Spector era is putting out a new album this fall, and he helped write the songs on it. And Stephen Van Zant helped uh, produce it. Uh, he's, yeah, he's he appreciates um, a quick story. Um, Brian Wilson, my other ob- obsession was is touring. Um, he was touring live, and you know they just had a movie about his life, and right. he was in Jersey, and Springsteen showed up. Oh, really? Yes, and so Springsteen was kind of in the back um, watching, and so they ended up getting him on stage, getting him a guitar. And so he sang um, a couple of songs on course, you know. And my wife and my friends said, if you're in that building, you could die happy, couldn't you, Justin? Uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> Brian Wilson, Bruce Springsteen, together on stage. Forget Chris getting married. Forget grandkids. This is the ultimate of your life. <laughs> So, well, if he had come in on a TARDIS, I think that would have go. been Absolutely. the end of you. Absolutely. Um, yes, it is. Um, it is so funny. So um, I just I, I admire the man and I see I love his work ethic. I love that he seems to um, he does a lot. He brings a kids on stage and sings with them. And he just is having fun, you know, playing music and. I think that's amazing that you should be. If you're getting paid to pay music. You should you love know, it. You should love it. You should show that yeah. joy. Absolutely. Well, and that's the complaint that a lot of people have with, you know, sports celebrities or even music celebrities where it's like yeah. at some point it doesn't seem like they love it. And this guy truly seems like he loves it. Steven Van Zant, I mean, this guy, uh, he loves it. Yes. And I think his whole band is this way, you know? Yes. So that, I, that is something that, good point, Jesse, that, that is yeah. true. Yes. And, you know, there's this um, there is a wonderful documentary called Springsteen and I, and uh, we'll probably do an episode where we talk about it in depth. But basically what happened is uh, they put a call out for fans to send in videos of why three words that describe Bruce Springsteen to them or tell their Bruce Springsteen stories. And so this filmmaker put it all together and made a documentary. And one of my favorite parts is they show a, a couple from, um, and I'm not sure what, where in Europe, but um, it's the husband, he's talking to the wife. Okay. And the wife is filming, and she, she says, what does Springsteen mean to you? And he says, love. Not love of him, not love of his music, love of you. Oh, wow. Because I go to all these shows because I love you. And so then they cut back to him after they show things. He goes, you know, I go to all these beautiful cities where there is fabulous architecture, you know, beautiful museums, and we spend the whole time going to a rock and roll show. <laughs> <laughs> and so, but um, you are seeing art, yes. So it does count. Yes. So he says, you know, I I love you, so I go to Bruce Springsteen concerts. Wow. So. That's pretty funny. So then you cut to, um, there's a bonus part and afterwards on the DVD, and they're showing Bruce, and Bruce is talking about, you know, I saw a rough cup of this documentary, and there was this couple where the guy just doesn't like my music. 
He says, and I was in a basement cafe or first floor cafe, and I looked out the window, and I go, that's them. <laughs> that's the guy who doesn't like me. And so he rushes out to get them, and the guy's like, oh, no, no, it's no, I love it. And so they bring him in, and he talks to him, and so they show a video, and he's like, do you have any requests? <laughs> and, and he actually said this in the movie. Um, he said – if you could tell Bruce Singh, what would you say? Make it shorter. <laughs> That's I fantastic. Hours. And so they show uh. up to the concert. Bruce said, I'm sorry. I didn't work for you. And this guy is so embarrassed. You know, he's like, no, no, no it's fine. So, um, that's another reason you just love Bruce because he gets it. Yeah. I'm, he's I'm, very I'm, real. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So Jesse, that, that brings us to another question. Yes. Your wish list. Yes. What's your wish list? A few songs that you hope to see him perform live. Something that you would, this would be your set. What would it be? Yeah. So um, one of the things that um, if you are a casual fan, you may not understand what we're talking about. But one of the things we're going to do is the name of the show, by the way, to give you set lusting, Bruce, is I don't know if other bands do this, but Bruce fans tweet the set list as it's going you know they will go bruce dallas and they'll say badlands yeah. and then you know they'll, they'll send the song and so as you go and there are websites that publish the set list after each show and they will highlight if this was a tour debut never they hadn't played this on the tour yet or if it's a sign request so because he's so diverse and because there's things you know, um, that there's people, and we talked about the signs, so almost all Bruce fans have a, kind of in the back of their hand, a wish list. Yeah, the dream they, list, sure. Yeah, I'd love to hear this song. Um, you know, I, I'd love to hear um, Better Days, which I just quoted if I did. Um, you know, I was lucky enough, and we may put this up on the feed. I, I put it on my Castle feed, but um, E Street Radio, which is the serious station dedicated to Springsteen, um, have different people you sign on and you can get chosen. I was picked to do what they call, you know, be the boss. Oh, fun. And you get to pick five Bruce Springsteen songs, and you talk about them, and you say, and one, the first song I picked was Linda Let Me Be the One, because... My wife's name is Linda, and she was Let Me Be the One. <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, so... A I, little I, on the nose, Jesse. Yes, exactly. Um, by the way, every... Our, our anniversary is June 2nd, and I post that every June 2nd, and I just think she rolls her eyes because she's not the biggest Springsteen fan. But I'm like, I'm so glad Linda did Let Me Be the One. Um, and yes, it is very much on the things. Um I would, um, I'd love to hear uh, some of the stuff from the new album. Um, the Wish is something he doesn't do very often. Um, a quick story: The Wish is about his mom, okay, and buying a, and the he talks about buying him a Japanese guitar at Christmas, and how um, he said that. You know, and the the song is all about all the things that that guitar brought them. Sure. And um, you know, and and he says, you know, and so I'd love to hear him do that. Yeah. Um, because it he doesn't do that a lot. Um, the promise is something that um he doesn't do a lot live. I'd like to see that. Um, and you know, I'm since I'm fairly new to Brewston. I would almost want, you know, almost anything from the old albums. Um, you know, and The Wish t ends with, last night we sat around laughing about all the things that this guitar brought us. And I lay awake thinking about the other things it's brought. And so tonight I'm taking requests here in the kitchen. This one's for you, Ma. But let me come right out and say it. If you're looking for a sad song, I'm not going to play it. Excellent. Yeah. So I think that would be fun to see. Um, I did run one in Houston. Um, you know, the song off um, Tunnel Love, One Step Up, Two Steps Back. 
and um, there was a sign request, and someone said the E Street Band had not played that since probably um, 87, 88 you know, whenever, whenever the album came out, like that tour. Okay. And so he played it with Patty doing backgrounds and the band, they had not rehearsed it. So it was basically just Bruce on the guitar and, um, you know, Max kind of did a simple beat and that was pretty cool. So that would, I think that would get most of them. Um, you know, the idea is that, um, you know, I just want to see him a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So so I think your wish list is everything, right? It's absolutely. And um you know you'll you'll hear there are some people that, you know, and they will talk about um they're chasing a song and to get back to our story, when you're tweeting these set lists, people started saying, "Well, I'm set lusting because I really would have liked to have been there to see this song. Sure, sure. Waiting to see. So it kind of seemed perfect for a podcast about the music and the uh, fun. You know what? It makes perfect sense. I, I'm going to equate things here a little bit. Yeah. Because I'm not a, a Bruce guy. I mean, I, I appreciate him, but it's not something that I'm like, oh my gosh, I, I <laughs> set lust. Uh, but everything you're saying, I'm a big Wilco fan. Ah, okay. And I've seen Wilco, I, I think one time we figured out it was close to 20 times that we'd seen Wilco. Okay. Over the years. And it's so similar. Uh, there were times that we saw them and they'd only played this song once and everybody was talking about it. I know that was before, when we saw them a lot, it was before tweeting. But now yeah. I get tweets that have the set list because it changes constantly. Yes. And lots of covers and lots of interesting experiments and... Uh, it just everything you're saying. It just reminds me of that so much. And and I bel- I just love the idea that. Um, I'll, and I know we're getting close to our time limit, but I, I I'll, I'll kind of sum this up for us in a way. It I was the Houston concert. It's over, and it was so good. And um, my wife was using the restroom. I had already used the restroom, and a young a lady probably my age so you know in her 50s what had had a drink or two and she's like is it over like yeah the show's over but he didn't do born in the usa (laughs) i see yeah i know he doesn't do that much live but that's his biggest hit Uh and you know and we were laughing and i and you know here's someone that if if he doesn't do many songs off born in the usa I mean, he either does Glory Days or he does Dancing in the Dark in his encore. He never does both. Well, I've never. He Very rarely he does both. Um, and, you know, he it's not that he's ashamed of it. It's just he's got so much other material. Right. And, um, and I love the fact that he is in his 60s and he's experimenting. He's picking songs out of the thing. He's doing Obscure. Right. Um, you know, he was in Australia, and he did a couple of songs that were from local artists, and the band did a version of Staying Alive that Barry Gibbs said brought tears to his eyes. Wow. And yeah, that's available on YouTube, too. And it is a to- – and he didn't do it sarcastically. He didn't do it ironically. They just did it as a full-fledged rock and roll number, and it is amazing with the horns and everything. Yeah. So – I, and so exactly, I mean, this could just as they'll be, you know, wishing for Wilco. Um, Ooh, and, I, I hear another uh, podcast coming. Yes, indeed. Um, and uh, yeah, I love that. I love that passion yeah. and that people are still loving what they do. They're doing it out there. And, um, you know, it's just, it's just something special. It really is. Yes. So Jesse, how do people reach you? I am so glad you asked. Um, if you want to be on the podcast and talk about Bruce and all that implies, please send us an email at setlustingbruce at gmail.com. We also are at setlustingbruce on Twitter. Um, we have a Facebook page, Set Lusting Bruce. Um, we already have three shows in the can. Uh, that is just wonderful. We've had some different guests. And I, um, you know, you don't have to have... 
you know, you didn't have to hitchhike through Europe to see Bruce 15 times. You know, maybe you've never seen him, but maybe he's gotten you through a tough time. Or maybe you just love listening to his music. Um, we'd love to have you on. And that's what the, the conversation, it's just going to be a conversation between Bruce fans. And we hope people like it and they hope people find us. Well, excellent. I know you're going to have an audience. I'm going to listen, and like I said, I'm not a Bruce fan, and I'm yeah. like, wow, this was great. It, it got me thinking about the stuff I am passionate about. Right. Wonderful show, Jesse. So, Thank you. It's your show, so yes. I'm going to step out now. I'm going to let you okay. close it out, but okay. thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to interview you and to talk about this. Well, I'm just really well. looking forward to this. Martha and I are just so excited for this show. So. Oh, I am too. So um, we just want to end with... Um, you know, at the end of every hard-earned day, people find some reason to believe. And um, that is Bruce's lyrics from Reason to Believe. And so the idea of the show is to remind you that believe in yourself, believe in your passions, and you will go out and have a better day. Thank you. We'll talk to you soon. Bye. Bye.